praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God bless all of us this evening for tuning in to uh, be part of this Bible discussion. Let's pray and ask God to bless us in his word that in the name of Jesus, Father, we thank you. We commit tonight's discussion to, to your hands for your blessings that you will teach us. You are the great teacher through your Holy Spirit. That you teach us your word, give us the heart, the faith to understand and respond. And we pray for the many hundreds and thousands who listen to this broadcast to be blessed. And draw them closer to yourself, forgive them their sins, and help them, Lord, to receive eternal life. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you tonight. The title of our Bible study is God the Righteous Judge. God. The righteous judge. God is the righteous judge. And, and at the heart of this discussion is the fact that God judges us and his judgment is already in the world. God judges us and his judgment is already in the world. This is at the heart of what we'll be discussing tonight. And people who are mindful of this fact that God judges us are living a careful and godly life and they are reaping you know, good uh, uh, judgment, receiving good judgment from God. Uh, while those who are not mindful of the fact that God judges us are uh, also living anyhow and are incurring his wrath. So the knowledge of, of, of the fact that God is the judge of the world, of the universe, uh, I think is something that is very, very important because then that will, as we'll be looking at, will be a motivation for us uh, to live a godly life. And also that gives us some sense of security in the sense that we know that there is the almighty God who sees all and who knows all and who is able to judge every human being, uh, no matter who that person or that demon or that Satan is. So that gives us that sense of security uh, to live in this world and to do well. So our main text uh, will be from the book of Romans 2, 4. The book of Romans 2, 4. That will be our main text for this evening. As I said, we are looking at the fact that God is the judge of the whole world. And that knowledge alone will motivate us to live well. So that we don't do anything that will harm us in any way. And I pray that tonight uh, our teachings will be a life transforming one for the many, many people. So Romans 2, 4 says, Or oh, do you show contempt for the riches of God's kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness intended to lead you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. But it says, God will repay each person according to what they have done to those who by persistence in doing good in doing good seek glory honor and immortality he will give them eternal life but for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil there will be wrath and anger there will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil first for the jew for obvious reason then for the gentile but glory, honor, peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. Amen. So here, the, the, the focus is on the fact that God is the righteous judge. Hence, he will judge all of us according to our deeds. And Paul writing to the Romans, mainly the Jews, he was telling them to pay attention to uh, this very topic that we are discussing tonight, that they receive the law. So if God will judge, will judge them first before the Gentiles. And also if God will bless, will bless them first before the Gentiles. And those of us who have come to the Lord, uh, God will judge us first. That is why Peter will tell us that for judgment will begin in the hearts of the Lord. And so God judges the world and his judgment is already uh, on us. And uh, this knowledge will help us in many, many, many ways. So uh, may the Lord bless us. Who is a judge? Simple in uh, English language. A judge is a public officer appointed to decide cases in a law court. 
It says he's a public officer, meaning that he serves the public. And God is not a public officer. He is the universal God. And he appointed that system of judgment to judge the whole universe. So not only us, angels, satans, and all the other beings as well. So God also has a court in heaven and he settled cases there. He has a court. We'll be looking at about two, three examples. And it's ongoing. It's ongoing. It's ongoing. And uh, someone will ask this question. If God is the righteous judge, why do wicked people seem to prosper and the righteous seem to suffer? If God is the righteous judge, how come some people are doing bad things but they seem to prosper and those who are really doing good things, they are? Uh, no, the answer is very simple. Scripture tells us, and it's quite uh, evident, that the wicked is like the grass of the field, which withers, but the righteous shall live forever. The book of Psalm 37, uh, the verses 1 to 4, Psalm 37, the verses 1 to 4, will tell us quite a lot that the wicked will not uh, live forever. At the right time, God will deal with the wicked. And the wicked has no chance, but the righteous will be like a tree planted by the riverside. And so uh, the writer uses how the grass uh, uh, springs up and, and then with us to describe how the uh, wicked will be dealt with. Psalm 37 verse 1 says, Do not fret because of those who do evil, or be envious of those who do wrong, for they... For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And he continues that. Commit your weight uh, to the Lord. The book of Psalm 92, uh, we see the same thing being repeated there. That, that indeed it shall always be well with the righteous, but not so with the wicked. And so we shouldn't worry that the wicked people seem to do well and they, they live a free life is not true. God gives them a period of time to judge them here on earth before they even uh, will be sent to hellfire. Psalm 96 verse 6, it says, Senseless people do not know, fools do not understand, that though the wicked spring up like grass and all evildoers flourish, they will soon be destroyed forever they were, and we have lots of examples in the bible and we know many people who lived a very bad life but yet are reaping the consequences uh, of their deeds but sadly because people have somehow neglected this very uh, knowledge that god judges us a lot of people live anyhow and they end up destroying themselves they forget somehow that there is that universal God who made us, who sustains us, and who judges us, they forget that. And so then they uh, destroy their beautiful, beautiful life. So let's look at the significance of, of God as the righteous. That is it really important to have a judge? It's truly it is important. If, if in our society we have a judge who settles kids, then I think it's obvious that God being the judge of the universe is, is the right thing, the right system in place. So that we all feel secure. Having God as a righteous judge in the entire universe provides, provides us with that sense of security in the world. Because we know he will deal with all the evil people that you know, are harming us. Sometimes we are powerless to confront evil because of various reasons. But God is able to bring them to justice. And we know from uh, Genesis 11 how God stepped in when there was that global project that was contrary to the will of God. No righteous person could do anything, but God stepped in. So, so God is, is even like police in the world, and he is dealing with good and bad people. And to me, that is a good news that any time I hear about a sermon on the, the judgment of God or the, the justice of God, that sermon you know, excites me uh, for the reasons that we are looking at. Uh, tonight, another uh, reason for for being happy that we have the righteous judges that uh, that knowledge uh, gives us a motivation to do what is right in life because we know that God will reward us for the good and punish 
people for the yeah, evil things. And so that gives us a motivation to live well and to do so well in this life. If not, then we will give, it's likely that we'll give ourselves to all kinds of things. And that is not our destiny. Hallelujah. The book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, uh, verse 13 and 14. Solomon concluding that book, he said, Now all has been said. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all man mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. So he said, this is the conclusion. Let's live well, obey God, because God will bring everything to judgment. He himself, you know, suffered quite a lot before he died because of how he uh, prostituted himself to worship idols and to do all kinds of things. But nevertheless, he wrote uh, this powerful uh, a, a conclusion for all of us to look at. So, so that gives us that sense of much. And, and so if there is a judge, then the judge has a law upon which he makes his judgment. Okay, so now let's talk about the law of God. And God's judgment is based on his law, not your law, not what you like, nor what I like or our desire. When you go to the law court, it's not about what you think or what you like or what you believe. It is about the laws of the land. That is, that is always the basis upon which a judgment is, are, are made. And God judges us based on his law. And so at some point, I'll be encouraged that you must know the laws of God so that you will not harm yourself. The book of Psalm 119, uh, verse 11, the psalmist says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Elsewhere, he writes that, Oh, teach me your laws so that I'll be careful to observe them. Teach me your laws, oh God, so that I'll be careful to observe them. Uh, the judgment of God is based on the law of God. And God's law has, has three main dimensions in summary I want to mention. It has three main dimensions. The first one is the laws that has to do with our relationship with him. And the laws that has to do with our relationship socially with one another and the created other. And the last one is uh, his law concerning our personal life. Now we must live and obey all these laws. Very simple. So God's laws are three dimensions. Our responsibility towards him. Our responsibility towards one another. And our responsibility towards ourselves. Three. Now the basis of God's law, as we all know, is love. And we always divide, define love according to God's word uh, as having the welfare of something at heart. So to love God means that you want the best for God. And to love your fellow human being is to wish and to do all that will bless that person. And to love yourself is the same way. To do good things for yourself. And so, in summary, love is the basis of God's law. So don't kill your neighbor, don't uh, uh, harm your neighbor, don't insult your neighbor. Don't harm yourself, don't treat yourself badly, don't insult God, don't, you know, the basis is love. You just want, want the welfare. And so, and so out of this love, we have thousands, 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 uh, uh, little, little these things lost. That God has given us. So our responsibility towards God is to worship Him and obey Him. And Solomon said, "Let's obey God because that is all that we need uh, to do. Because if, if you worship God truly, you will love your fellow human being and you treat yourself well. And and then you know, so you may not even need all the written laws because whatever you are doing, you ask yourself, is it the right thing or not?" And that is how God really wants us to live. And in case we get it wrong, which we'll be looking at, the, the righteous God must be a just God. So, so just uh, think this way. When you go to the law court, if you are found guilty, the judge will say, okay, you are forgiven, but you serve this sentence. So the judge cannot just say, you are guilty, but go home. No. There must be some kind of punishment. Something must absorb your guilt. But we will come to this uh, in a moment, and that will explain why we need Christ, you know, as our atoning sacrifice, so that He will absorb uh, sins. In the book of uh, Revelation 14, 
uh, 6 verse 7, we see here the angel of the Lord reminding the inhabitants of the world that fear God and obey his uh, judgment. Revelation 14, 6 and 7, I read, Then I saw another angel flying overhead with the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship the one who made the, who made, uh, the heavens and the earth, and the sea, and the springs of water. And so now the angel uh, uh, you know, was giving us this message, because uh, at that time there won't be any human being to do the preaching uh, of the gospel. So if there is a judge, then there is a law upon which the judge, makes his own uh, a judgment and so learn more about the laws of God so that you'll be able to live well in this life and also to receive a good rewards from God. Now God judges, God's judgment blesses and destroys people depending on their deeds. Uh, this is also at the heart of what it means for God to be a judge. Now our second thing that I want to spend maybe 10 minutes on is the fact that God judges us and his judgment is already in the world. Thus, we have temporary judgment, and then we have the final judgment. We have temporary judgment, and we have the final judgment. The book of Romans uh, 1.18 uh, introduces this very uh, uh, thought that God already uh, judges us before we experience the final judgment, uh, as the book of Revelation chapter 20 tells us. So the book of, let's read the book of Romans 1, we start from 18, the book of Romans 1, 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And so it's being revealed, the wrath is being revealed from heaven. Romans 1, 18, read the whole uh, uh, passage up to verse 32. And it explains a lot God's temporary judgment, how he uh, gave some people up to uh, to become futile in, 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 in their, so that their foolish heart will also be darkened. And how God gave some people up over, over to the sinful desires of their heart, the sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. And how people exchange the truth of God for a lie, how people worship God. Uh, created this instead of worshiping the true God, God temporarily He takes away His wisdom from them so that certain people are not able to descend and to uh, give themselves to what is good and bad. But we will uh, be looking into this a bit more. The book of First uh, Timothy 5 24 25. First Timothy 5 24 25. We see the same theme. Here the word of God says, First Moses 5, 24, uh, 25. The sins of some are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind them. In the same way, good deeds are obvious. And even those that are not obvious cannot remain hidden forever. So there are some people, their sins are obvious. Their sins have reached the place of judgment ahead of them. It means the judgment has been, uh, 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 you know, uh, issued before they even get to the final uh, judgment day. And others too, their sins are trailing behind them. So then, on the judgment day, all that all their sins that they kept hidden will be revealed to them, and they'll be surprised that heaven has uh, records of all that they've done in the world. But there are some people that their sins have already reached heaven. And so they are receiving their sentences now in this world. We'll be mentioning two of such people in the Bible. For us to understand how some of these things. Well, let's go to the book of First Kings chapter 22, uh, verse 19 to 22. First Kings 22, 19 to 22. It talks about a king called Ahab and how wicked he was. The chapter 21 tells us that he repented temporarily when the prophet Elijah told him of his sin. But still later on, he went back and became very wicked. And how the prophet Micaiah told him that heaven has sat and have judged you and have set up a trap for you, trap, a tra a trap for you to be destroyed. 
And he was surprised to hear that. So let's read the book of 1 Kings 22. Let's start from 19. The prophet uh, Micaiah speaking here. So Micaiah continued. Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the multitudes of heaven standing around him on, on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab into attacking Ramoth Gilead and going to his death? One suggested this and another that. Finally, a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. But what means the Lord asks? I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of his prophet, he said. You will succeed in enticing him, said the Lord. Go and do it. And so the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of this prophet of yours. The Lord has decreed a disaster for you. Hmm. So this is a temporary judgment, ongoing judgment in real time. So God wasn't waiting to the final day of the judgment day before he would judge. Aha, no. Heaven sat and they said, let us punish this man, this king. And how should we do it? And the host of heaven this was suggesting this and this was suggesting that. And finally, one of them said, I will be a deceiving spirit and I will enter into the mouth of his prophets. And what that meant was that the prophet prophesied uh, falsely and I have believed the wrong uh, prophecy. So he went to the, that war and those of who know the story, he died through the war. So so the, the judgment of God is ongoing. It's ongoing that people must understand is that God sees all. And therefore, they have to be very careful how they live. They must live a good life and enjoy this world before uh, finally God calls them to heaven. Another example is the life of King Nebuchadnezzar and his son. The life of King Nebuchadnezzar, his son. Well, so we read the book of Daniel 5, uh, verse 1 to 6, then we'll jump to 17 to 31. We are looking at the fact that God's judgment is already in the world. It's ongoing. Yeah. So just be, whatever you are doing, God sees. And if your sin reaches a level, what he does is that he takes his grace from you. Then you do the serious ones, then the judgment comes quickly. Okay. And then we'll also be looking at how God is also blessing people and commissioning people for greater work. So let's try to get this a bit more. Now let's look at the life of King Nebuchadnezzar and his son. The chapter 5 talks about what his son did. Nevertheless, when Daniel was given the interpretation, he made reference to what his father did, which he didn't repent until so God judged his father. And the son also even did worse things than what the dad did. This is the story that we are coming to read. The son became king. He had a great banquet, invited all his friends and nobles, and as they were drinking, he said, go into the temple of the Lord and bring the goblets, the cups that were made for the Lord. Let's use those cups to serve our guests. You see how stupid we will become. If you want to have a good party, go to the shop and get your own glasses. Now, they go to the temple of the Lord and take those things that belong to God. And they were using that to party and to chill. Now, when you see people doing all kinds of things regarding God, the church, and Christians disrespecting Things I'm telling you that itself is a judgment, but many people do not know. They may think that they are champions, they are on fire, it's just a matter of time they'll be destroyed. When you see people sinning uh, this way, it means that, that God has given them over. Okay, but let's go to the text and get a bit more. The book of Daniel 5, let's read 1 to 6, then we we'll jump to verse 17 to save time. Open uh, your Bibles with me, and today is. Uh, uh, today is Bible study, so make sure you have your Bibles and notebooks and pens and make notes. And also, uh, as we read the Word of God, try to open the text. Uh, yeah, I can see uh, quite a lot of people online live here. And that God bless you. Very soon we will say hi to, to everyone. So let's see how God temporarily judged uh, Kinebuchadnezzar and his son. Daniel 5. The king, Belshazzar, gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, 
he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wife and his concubines, might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblet, a goblet that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wife and his concubines, drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, wood, iron, and stone. So you see what they did? You are having a party. Why do you go into God's house and take those goblets, those items, to serve your guests? You can easily get some. And so heaven sat and he was judged. Let's go verse 5 says, Suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lamb stamp in the royal place. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. You see? Suddenly the fingers of a human hand that is why the Bible, we say that it is God's word, but it was written by human beings. Because God will use human resources to communicate, to minister to us. So this very message, the Bible says that then the fingers of a human hand appeared and was written. Uh, verse, now seven, verse 7 says, The king summoned the enchanters and astrologers and diviners. Then he said to these wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck and he will be made the third highest ruler. So if you read, uh, a search was made to look for someone to just yes, interpret the word of God to the king. And that is why you have to count it blessed to have someone to teach you the word of God so that you will do well. There are a lot of people that don't understand the Bible. They don't understand what God says and sometimes they think God is wrong because the word of God is not valid or it contradicts itself. No, the problem is you. S look for someone to teach you the word of the Lord. That is why God expect the, expects the church to teach people, you know, his word, etc. And so a search was made and he first consulted his, uh, you know, idol worshippers if anyone could come. None of them uh, 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 volunteered to do that. And so finally, they found David. And David did that. Verse 17. Let's jump to 17. So David was brought in, and the king told him everything. And the king said, can you help me? Look at what Daniel said. Verse 17. Then Daniel answered the king, may you keep your gift for yourself and give your reward to someone else. That is the right approach. We don't take gifts from wicked people. We don't take gifts from people who hate the Lord, who hate the church, who wants to harm the church of God. Now, if you have taken the goblet from the temple of God and you have abused God and dishonored my God, what, what gift do you have for me? Daniel, if you want to interpret what he said, this is what he meant. You have no gift for me. Not, I don't need your reward because you are not righteous and the wrath of God is on your head. And so I don't need your, righteous, uh, your, your reward. So, so, so that's what Daniel said, verse 18. So he said that, let me explain to you, 18, your majesty... The Most High God gave your, your father, Nebuchadnezzar, sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. So Paul, uh, sorry, Daniel referenced what happened to his dad and before he gave him the, um, his own uh, uh, judgment or explained his own judgment to him. Uh, 19, because of the high position God gave him, all the nations and peoples of every language dreaded and feared your father in the book of Nazar. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. And those he wanted to promote, he promoted. And those he wanted to humble, he humbled. 20. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was disposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. And he lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like the ox. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven. Until he acknowledged that the most high God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth. And, and, and sets them 
and sets over them anyone he wishes. So he gave this reference that this will happen to your father. God bless him. The whole nation, the whole world feared your father. Your father did whatever he wanted to any human being because God was with him. But when pride entered him, God disciplined him again. When you read uh, Daniel uh, 4 and 3, uh, again, heaven sat and judgment was passed on, on against King Nebuchadnezzar. So let's continue from verse 22. So now here, Daniel is coming to tell uh, his son, Belshazzar, his own, you know, uh, like coming to read his own verdict to him. So verse 22 says, But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. So there are some of you who know all things, but still, you want to do what your ancestors did. You have to come out. If not, same uh, judgment will follow you. 23. Instead, you have set up yourself against the Lord of heaven. You, you, you had the goblets from his temple brought to you. And you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This is the inscription that was written, and I'll try to read it. Mene, mene, tekel, passe. Here is what these words mean. Mene, meaning God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. The tekel, or tekel, means you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Okay, you have been weighed, a giant will weigh you, will weigh your deeds, and you have been found wanting. And then the, and then the, a perish, your kingdom is divided and given to the murders and the patients. And so, you have been, God has numbered the days of your reign, and that's come to an end. Verse 29 says, Then Belshazzar's, Belshazzar's command, Daniel was, then at, the, at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was pro pro proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Verse 30 reads, That very night Belshazzar, the king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the maid took over the kingdom at the age of 62. So that night, his kingdom came to an end. We are focused on the fact that the judgment of God is ongoing. So this king, Nebuchadnezzar's son, Belshazzar, on the final judgment day, he will rise from the dead and he will come and stand before God, but not to receive a reward, but to be sentenced to hellfire. So the judgment is ongoing, and such a knowledge, I'm sure, will encourage all of us to live very well and enjoy the blessings of God until he calls us finally into his kingdom. If you ignore the fact that God is a righteous judge, if you don't want to know, if you don't want to know, then you, you may decide to live anyhow. But again, that will not exempt you from his judgment. God will still judge you. God will, I mean, this king's son knew all that happened to his father. But for some reason, he decided not to even consider the fact that God judges the world. And truly, he was judging. And that night, his kingdom came to an end. And now let's look at, again, so even I can tell that there are many people uh, who are still serving their sentence. And it's good that we read Isaiah 40, verse 1 and 2. And then we look at how God is also blessing other people. Isaiah 40, verse 1 and 2. Isaiah 40. Uh, it tells us how now God was uh, comforting the people uh, because they have been under the wrath of God for a long time. And so Isaiah 40, the title is Comfort for God's People. Isaiah 40 verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her heart service has been completed. That her sin has been paid for. That she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Have you seen how it works? So Jerusalem, you have served your sentence. 
And so now God says, I'm coming to comfort you. So, so when you are Christian and you live anyhow, it gets to a point where God will sentence you. And you have to serve that term. And once you finish, then he comes in to comfort you. Right? Now he tells the same thing to uh, Jerusalem. And then he gave them wonderful promises. Verse 3, a voice of one calling uh, uh, in, the, in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see uh, uh, it together. And so now God said, I'm about to bless Jerusalem, having served your sentence. And there are many people that were serving their sentence because of what they've done in the past. And when you are going through such times, you humble yourself, you seek the faith of God. And once God sees your humility and your repentant heart, he comes and restores and gives you true life and live on. There's a king called Amenasseh. He lived, I think he reigned in Israel for 55 years. And I think the longest reign that we have in the Bible. He, because he, he started badly, but later on he changed his life. So God gave him more years to live. And there are many of you who have lived in a very bad way, done all kinds of things. I think it's time for you to change, repent. And you are going to be disciplined. The New Testament we will we use the word discipline, but nevertheless, it's far better than dying in your sin. God will forgive you, but he will discipline you and restore you. And then again, you know, comfort you and bless you. But So let's look at how God is also blessing other people. So the judgment is not just to condemn, but the judgment is also to commission, to give salvation, to bless people. We look at the life of uh, Joshua, uh, Joshua in the book of Zechariah 3. Zechariah 3, verse 1 to 7. The, the the judge does not only does not only condemn, he also blesses and commissions and releases people to do great works in this world. And it's very beautiful. The book of uh, Zechariah 3. Let's start from one. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his side, his right side to accuse him. So uh, Joshua was brought in the spiritual realm to the presence of God, the court. And Satan was standing here, accusing Joshua, accusing Joshua. So Satan entices us. And once we sin, then he can accuse us. So that's why you don't have to sin. Because when you are brought before the judge, God, your sins will be revealed and it must be dealt with. But let's see what uh, happened there. Verse 2, the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Is not this man a sinner that we have just pulled him from the fire? He was being burnt, and we have pulled him from being destroyed in hellfire. So this man is here not because he's righteous, but because he's a sinner, and we are here to declare him and to forgive him his sin. So why do you bring judgment, condemnation upon someone who is already condemned? But the reason why he's in, in our presence is that we're about to forgive him his sins. So we rebuke you. Okay? Why? Because Joshua lived for God. And so God now had the right to say, because you live for me, because you want forgiveness, I'll forgive you. All right? So, so let's continue. It's verse 3. Now we see uh, 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 how Joshua stood before the Lord. Verse 3 says that now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel of the Lord. Then the angel then the angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. I uh, think R.C. Sproul may his uh, soul rest in perfect peace. He once said that the only way you and I can enter heaven is to wear someone's clothing. Because the clothing that you have, they won't allow you to enter heaven with those clothing. The clothing means that whatever, who, uh, who we are, you know, how we present ourselves, unless we take on something that is more righteous. And so he concludes by saying, unless we take on the righteousness of God, the righteous government of Christ, we will never be allowed to enter heaven. And here we see that Joshua was standing before the presence of God. 
but his his garment was so filthy. And then the angel of the Lord said, Take off this garment. Take it off. Take it off. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin, and I'll put a fine garment on you. Before you can stand before the I mean uh, holy God. And verse 5 said, Then I said, Put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. Six, the angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you will walk in obedience to me and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and have charge of my courts. And I will give you uh, a place among these standing here. Right. So he say that your sins are forgiven and I'm commissioning, I'm, I'm commissioning you to go to the world and do great things. And if you obey me, I'll give you inheritance among the, all these angels. These people you see in heaven. I'm going to give you a place. When you read the book of Acts chapter 20, it says, Paul defending the gospel before the authorities. He made a mention of something similar like this that happened to him. He was told to rise up and go and watch so that his sins will be forgiven. He must preach the gospel and that if he remain faithful, he also will receive his inheritance. And we see God commissioning Joshua here. And there are many of you, as you open your heart, your life to God, that is what heaven will do for you. Heaven will take away your sins, put a garment of righteousness on you, and will commission you to do great things in the world. And if you remain faithful, you receive eternal uh, inheritance. You receive that gift, that crown of life that Christ has promised all true uh, uh, faithful uh, saints. And so it's the judge does not only condemn, he also commissions. And he helps us. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. Take away our old uh, desires and our old habits and gives us something very, very new. And so God judges us and his judgment is already in the world. Now there are those who, there are those that God is forgiven and there are those that God is also commissioning to do great things. Now let me mention one other good thing that you can learn when it comes to the judgment of God. And it is what I have called appealing to God for justice. You have to appeal to God for justice. If someone does you something that you are not happy with, appeal to God for justice. Or oh, my brother, master, God knows how to do it better than you. Yeah, yeah just, just appeal to God for justice. Appeal to God for justice. And we'll look at two examples here in the Bible. Uh, a man called Nehemiah and also a man called uh, 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 Jehoshaphat. How they appeal to God. For just, but let's read this opening uh, uh, sentence, Romans 12, 17 to 21, and we will take, we'll take two examples. We are learning, we want to uh, understand how we can appeal to God instead of we taking matters into our own hands, wasting our time and our resources. We can appeal to God. He is the great judge. Romans 12, 17 to 21. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Mean, mean that don't sit on the judge's seat to... to you say that you've done this to me, I'm also going to pay evil. Don't do that. That is not your job. That's not your job. Be careful to do what is right, right in the eyes of everyone. That is your job. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome evil, but overcome evil with good. So we are not supposed to judge. That doesn't mean that telling someone, oh, you've done ABCD against me, you are not judging the person. You are just telling the person what is going on. But to judge means that you have done A to me, so I'm also going to do B to you. No. Our job is to always do good. And then we leave the judgment to God. Okay? Now, two men did this. Nehemiah and then King Jehoshaphat. Let's read Nehemiah's one. The book of Nehemiah 4, 1 to 6. We know Nehemiah was the one who rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. And he met opposition, a whole star people, the, the Sanballat and Tobias and the many people they oppose him they did all kinds of things to him and on one occasion they threatened him 
They said all kinds of things, and but how Nehemiah responded, I think, was something very remarkable that we have to look at together. The book of Nehemiah 4 1 to 6 it says that to, uh, when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their war? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble? Burn as they are. 23. Tobiah, the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they are building, even a fox climbing up upon it will break down their stones. Break down their wall of stones. So they were just insulting the Himalayan like today. If you want to do God's work, people who don't love God will insult, they will ridicule you, they will rebuke you, they will say all kinds of nasty things about you. And when you see someone saying nasty things about a man who is trying to do something good a little, trust me, that the one insulting is an, an, uh, it's not a righteous person. But the one trying to do good, to me, is a righteous person. Irrespective of the fact that the person has weaknesses, okay? So what the, the unrighteous does is that they watch what the righteous is doing and squeeze out all the negativity they can get and use it against the righteous. Nehemiah, they were building the, uh, the walls with the little strength that they had. And these Tobias and Sambalat and others were great men in Jerusalem, but they were not worshippers of God. And so they were the opposers of the things of God. But let's see how... how and Nehemiah responded to what they did to him. Verse 4, Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over a splendor in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your side. For they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So when we rebuild the wall till all of it reached half its height. For, so we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. For the people worked with all their heart. So when you are confronted with such situation and you are on a good project, don't stop the project and be focusing on the people. No. Go to your closets and pray to God and hand over the whole matter to God. Now go back and focus on your work because you have a lot to do in this world. And said people are distractors, they have nothing to offer, right? So instead of wasting your time and to think about them and to cry and to do that, go to the Lord and pray. Say, Lord, I hand them over to you. Deal with them because you are the righteous child. Uh, King David did the same to Ahithophel. Ahithophel uh, changed camp. And he joined the camp of uh, Absalom to rebel and to kill David and when David was told he prayed a simple prayer and said Lord turn all Ahitophel's advice into foolishness the Bible says that Ahitophel gave a wonderful advice to Absalom but God hadn't Absalom said that he wouldn't take Ahitophel's advice and, 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 and Absalom said Ahitophel has spoken but this time your advice is not really good the Bible says that really hurt Ahithophel. He went home, put his household in order, and committed suicide. David prayed a one-line prayer. Oh, Lord, turn all of Ahithophel's advice into foolishness. One word, one word, one word in, in prayer. My brothers, let's learn how we can appeal to the righteous God. And he will do the, the, the judgment for us so that we can focus to do what is right. You don't have much time to waste at all for you to be spending all your energy on those who are chasing the demons and the principalities, the witches and all the bad dudes around us. No, just pray and hand them over to the Almighty God. For you have so much to do. Let's look at another example, King uh, uh, Jehoshaphat. We are looking at this topic, God the righteous God, and how we can appeal to this God instead of we taking things into our own hands. And the righteous God, the powerful God, He knows what to do. And we can sit back and focus on our mission on earth and our assignment on that, our purpose on that, as a righteous judge does his own good things. And whatever he does is always good.
And for me, this gives me a sense of security and a motivation to live a very good life because I know I will be rewarded. And if I don't, God will judge me. For God is not a, he, he, he's not a partial judge. That's what we call the righteous God, the faithful one. At the book of uh, 2 Chronicles 20, we see the same thing uh, that the King uh, Jehoshaphat did. Uh, again, when people attack uh, at them, he he just pleaded to God. He pleaded to God. He pleaded to God. And so, yeah, if you have time, I read, I read uh, at the book of uh, uh, Second Chronicles twenty. I'm I'm just trying to look at up for a few verses so that uh, I will just read. And so let's read from verse one. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites with some of the Minoites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Okay, and the verse 4 says, So the people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek help from the Lord. And verse 5, Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, the God of ancestors, and ye, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and, and might are in your hand. And no one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your heart? Israel, and gave it, to, gave it forever to the descendant of Abraham, your friend. They have lived in it and have built in, in, a, a, built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress and and you will hear us and save us 10 but now here are men from Ammon, Moab and Mount Seir whose territory you will not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt so they turned away from them and did not destroy them see how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you have gave us as inheritance our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you, Lord. Our eyes are upon you. Our eyes are upon you. That's what Joseph did. He appealed to God and said, Lord, judge them. Okay, Lord, judge them. Judge them. Instead of him just fighting them himself. And the rest of the story uh, tells us how the Lord gave them said, a resounding victory because he judged the situation right and so and so try but but two conditions need to be met if you want to appeal to god two conditions you cannot build the offending party and still appeal, appeal for justice it doesn't work make sure you have clean hands you must make sure you are not at fault if you want to appeal appeal to god make sure you are not at fault in that way of course then once the judge judges uh, you will be declared, you know, you know, uh, uh, guilty. But if you are thought that you are in trouble, that is why we confess our sins to God, so that He forgives us. If not, if the case go to, goes to the court, we will be in trouble. Yes. So uh, King Jehoshaphat could do that because he had clean hands. As so I said, Lord, look at how they are coming to invade us. They are a vast army, but we have no power to fight them. So you are the righteous judge, do the right thing. He appealed to God and God stepped in to do awesome things. When you draw closer to God and you live that godly life, you have the confidence to go to God in such times to appeal uh, for justice. Let's also mention that salvation and judgment go hand in hand. So, so as God sits in his court, as he is forgiven, he is also punishing. A typical example is when Israel left Egypt. As God was redeeming Israel, he was punishing uh, uh, Egypt. Okay, As God was redeeming Israel, he was uh, punishing the, the Egyptians. That's salvation and judgment goes hand in hand. Whatever thing that is responsible in your life must be punished. And whatever thing that is responsible in your life, in your life must be rewarded. So the judgment and salvation, go, uh, they go hand in hand in hand and and then uh, you, you must learn to uh, understand some of this so when you think about your salvation you must also think about about who will absorb your punishment for the sins you have committed and this is because the righteous judge cannot just overlook your sins so that both God's kindness and justice can be met and that is why forgiveness of sins is very very important the moment you think about your salvation 
Think about who will absorb all your sins. The more you think about heaven, think about who absorbs all your sins. And that is why when you come to Christ, Christ absorbs your sins so that you will become the righteousness of God. Christ, take away your sins. If not, once you stand before the judge and there's no one to absorb your sins, then you will serve the sentence. And the sentence of sin is death and hellfire. Right. So the book of Isaiah chapter 53 verse 4. I mean such a beautiful reading. Uh, will say that Isaiah 53 verse 4 will, will teach us how uh, Christ absorbs our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was now put on him. Okay, so that we will be free. If you don't have Christ Jesus as your Lord, then you will serve your own uh, 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 sentence. Isaiah 54 says that surely he, that is Christ, took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we consider him punished and stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to their own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So when he was hung on the cross, God puts all of us, our sins, on Christ. So that when we stand before God, God can declare us righteous. And in doing that, that the kindness of God to you, the sinner, and the ju justice of God to himself has been met. So sin must either be forgiven or punished. So when you give your life to Christ, who died for your sins, Christ takes your sins, and therefore you become right. If not else, if you stand before uh, the great judge, you'll be in, in a very, very big trouble. The book of uh, Romans 5 uh, will also summarize this very theme this way. The book of Romans 5 will summarize. Uh, verse 6 says that, You see, I just at the right time when we were so powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good reason someone might possibly dare to die. For God demonstrated his own love for us in this, while we were so sinners, Christ died for our sins. 9. Since we have not been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? So, when you receive Christ, because he died for your sins, you are not going to die for your own sins. His blood, his life has exchanged you know, your life, that which you deserve. And so then we don't uh, incur God's wrath. So think this way, that the more you think about salvation, also think about who absorb your sin. Christ Jesus is the one who absorbed. I think we know the story, this story, when Jacob wanted to cheat on Esau for his blessings, uh, uh, Jacob said, Mom, if dad hears of this, he's going to curse me. And the mother said, Rebecca said, let the curse be on my head. Let the curse be on my head. So Jacob did that. And then when the dad find out, of course, the curse went on Rebecca's head. So we know the life of Rebecca. I mean, she died prematurely because she absorbed all the curse that Jacob was supposed to have. So anytime you sin, and if there is no one to absorb your sin, you will serve your own sin. And the wages of sin is always dead. So as even though we, we think of God as a righteous judge, and we are happy to have him sit on the throne, and, and that motivates us to do the right thing. And that gives us a sense of security. We must also think that when we sin, that same righteous judge will, will judge us. And as you watch me, you have so many sins. And the question is, is Jesus your Lord and Savior? If the answer is yes, you can go to him. First John 1, 8. If you confess our sins, he will forgive us. Christ will forgive you so that you stand right before God. So let's keep this in mind as well. That that. A Christ will. So let's look at the final theme and then we'll bring the service to uh, a close final theme that God has entrusted the judgment to the Son, uh, to the Son, the book of uh, John 5 22. So Jesus will be the one who will do the judgment. Uh, he, he will judge us. God Himself will not do it. And then we will explain this a bit, then we will be concluding. Uh, John 5. 22. We are talking about the fact that God has entrusted all judgment to Christ, His Son. Okay, so Romans 5, John 5, 22 says, Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, 
that all may honor, honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent me. Christ will be the judge, and after he has judged everyone, and even judged death, then he hands over the kingdom to the Father. And then we now begin to live in a new heaven and a new heaven. That is why Christ must be your Lord and Savior. Lord in the sense that he will be your judge. Lord is the one who judges. So our 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 judges will, will, will refer to them as lords because they judge, they pass sentence, and they make decision. Christ will be doing that on behalf of God. And that is why he must be your Lord and Savior. So just imagine having your Lord and Savior in, in, a, in a judge in you. So the judge is your is your savior at the same time. So he looks at you and says, because of what I did for you, you are set free. Give your life to Christ and let him be the only Lord, the only voice that you hear, that you follow, that you obey. Uh, the God has entrusted the preaching of the gospel to the church and the church must preach the gospel. God has entrusted, I mean, the a, 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 a governance of the society uh, to human leaders. So our leaders, God, expects them to do well and to treat the people well. Nebuchadnezzar was giving that tax and he messed up. God dealt with him. And all world leaders, if they don't lead the people in righteousness and they don't do the right thing, we the citizens, we can be assured that God who knows all will judge and deal with them. He did that to King Nebuchadnezzar and no one is above God. And so God has given them that authority to take care of us. And God entrusted judgment to Jesus to judge us. And God has entrusted the gospel to the church. Paul will say in 1 Corinthians 16, I think 9, that woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. Why? Because God entrusted the gospel to him, the church. In the book of Acts chapter 6, the disciples said, It's not good for us to wait on tables and to neglect the word of the Lord and prayer. Preachers of the gospel, we are not supposed to, to, to be doing social work. We are supposed to be preaching the gospel. Then we hand over the social activities to the deacons and then other church leaders. Uh, so, so those who have been anointed to, to preach the gospel, that is our task. But sometimes people expect even the pastors to do social things. Then we neglect the preaching of the gospel and then prayer. And the result is that a lot of people don't hear the gospel. A lot of people don't live right. And, and even the, those social activities, then they mean nothing to us. So the social work should be handed over to the deacons and other leaders. And then the servants of God, those who have been anointed to preach the gospel, must attend to this. So when we say that Christ will be the judge, God has entrusted all judgment to his care. We are saying that in this world, everyone has a responsibility. And do your work, let me do my work, and let our governments do their work in righteousness, and God will bless or deal with them, uh, depending on how they lead us. So church, uh, our sermon has been very simple that we shall all be judged by God and God is God overall and God judges us and his judgment is already in the world and people who are mindful of God's judgment are living a careful life those who are not mindful of the fact that God judges our deeds are incurring his wrath and having God as a righteous judge in the entire universe provides us with a sense of security in the world because we know that he will deal with all the evil people in the world that we are powerless to handle. And this also gives us that motivation to live and to do what is right. And the message is very simple. God is our judge. He sees us, he watches over us, and rewards according to our deeds. And his judgment is ongoing. God bless you for tuning into the sermon this uh, very, very evening. God bless you. So let me say hello to a few people and then we can all say goodbye. So first to uh, Juan, uh, God bless you. Our sister Lorraine, Francois, God bless you. Simon Yaboa, it's been a long time. Nina uh, Frimpoma, yes, God bless you. Greetings to uh, Henrietta. And then we have T. Bangali, God bless you where you are watching from. We have Ajua Sase, Brother J. Emmanuel, and, and Melvin. Along then, also watching with us. God bless you, Melvin. Then we have Sam Ann. God bless you, Chrissy Henry. God bless you. We have uh, Bers Ekenwa. Um, uh, Kent, God bless you. Then we have uh, Enyanam Ekan. Also, God, he say, Ha, I love it. Beautiful. God bless you. We have Stefano. 
We have uh, Sharon Smith, God bless Sharon, and we have Johnny uh, Johnson, God bless, and greetings to St Stacy Demps. Okay, Stacy is also online, God bless you, Stacy. We have Stephanie Arma Bright, God bless you, from Tiberi, and our brother Ray Jr., God bless you, greetings to Arma. Then we have uh, Krista Bell, God bless you, Cecilia Fletcher, God bless you. Then we have Shanti Shantar. God bless you. And uh, Jay Emmanuel says, uh, Amen, Bishop. God bless you. So may the Lord bless all of us. And uh, may the Lord bless all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So we will see ourselves again, God willing, on Sunday. And as I said, the restrictions are being lifted and so very soon I'll make time to visit uh, all of you before hopefully we start assembly together in the presence of the Lord in the month of July if conditions improve but for the meantime keep safe and continue to keep the faith live well and follow the instructions and let's keep praying trusting that the Lord will do all the good that he has promised so far it's been good and the good God who began that wonderful things in your life, uh, he will finish it. So may the Lord bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.